I used to suck at Ultra Kill, and some of you might even say that I still do. When Ultra Kill first dropped in Early Access a couple of years ago, I thought that it was just a creative arena shooter that took cues from games like Doom Eternal and Devil May Cry. Doom Eternal on a budget is how I would hear influencers describe it at the time, and while that metaphor definitely helped the game gain some notoriety, I also think that it gave some people like me the wrong impression. If you tried to play Ultra Kill like Doom Eternal, especially now after two plus years of updates and balances, you'd probably still have a good time, but you'd be missing out on a lot of what makes Ultra Kill special. And that was the case when I made my video on it almost immediately after the game was available for purchase. So I'm going to be treating most of this video as if I'd never done a video on Ultra Kill before, and that 13 minutes of uninformed and uneducated takes never really happened. I plan to keep the video public for archiving reasons, so don't worry, it's not going to be going anywhere. And even if I wanted to, I don't think I'd have the heart to remove it. This was one of the first videos of mine to start getting love from the algorithm, so I don't think that I'd be the YouTuber or creator that I am today without it. It's still a bad video, but I'm not going to unlist it. I wanted to use this video as a way to repent my Ultra Kill sins, and I don't think I could do that by just sweeping this older video under the rug. Also, 13 minutes? Are you kidding me? That is pathetically short. You know, sometimes I feel like my content hasn't changed at all, and then I look at my catalog. What the hell happened? Alright, now stick with me here because I'm gonna lay some ground rules for how this video is gonna play out. First up, this is gonna be a playthrough on a fresh save file on the highest difficulty available at this time, which is violence. Maybe I'll cover the game in the future on a higher difficulty once it's added, but until then, TBD. Second off, each level will be covered with at least two playthroughs of each mission. One primarily focused on covering all secrets and exploration, something I'll take much slower so I can write proper notes and create a proper report on each of the missions, and another one for achieving the P ranks. Uh, I'm assuming the P stands for perfect and not for piss. Why do you use yellow? I get it, it's gold, but come on. I will also not be moving on from a level until I meet these requirements. This means that I won't be using gear from a later act in the game to come back to a previous level for the P rank. And the same goes for weapons used in later levels. For example, I won't be using the nail gun before Limbo, no rail gun or knuckle blaster before Lust, and so on and so forth. Each stage will be covered on its own, and I will be covering just about everything that I could think of that's worth discussing. I will be covering secret levels, but only in between the layers. This could be before or after each respective layer, it really just depends on what I think is best for pacing at the time. I'll also be playing without the main HUD because I play better without it. This wasn't done deliberately just to give a cinematic feel to the video, I just I genuinely play better without having a HUD. Alright, that's not entirely the case, I will be using the crosshair HUD. Everything I need is right here in the center of my vision. A green bar for health, blue segments for stamina, and that's all I really need. It's not exactly perfect, you don't have the status of your railgun or which hand you're using. Honestly, if something like that could be added to the side, kind of like Doom Eternal's race car HUD, that would be basically perfect. You can relax, I'm not going to be covering all of these settings because we're forced to do so when we start a new save file. Yeah, did you know that you could set a new save file? I sure didn't when I made my video last time. That's the reason I reviewed it on violence without knowing even how to play it on violence because I didn't know how to go back and refresh my save for regular difficulty. But whatever, I've gotten better at the game, I'll, I'll prove it to you in just a moment. So let's, uh, let's go rip off the band-aid now, shall we? We play as V1, a bloodthirsty robot making its way to the gates of hell. Man is dead, blood is fuel, and hell is full. A slogan that I never really gave much thought to other than how badass it sounded until Act 2 dropped. I thought that it was just a clever way to explain how V1 heals himself, but I'll be discussing that later on. I also want to give a quick shout out to my friend Herb Messiah. If you've ever tried to look into the advanced techniques of Ultra Kill, chances are you've seen some of his videos. He's been a huge help with this piece and aided me a lot with a lot of the numbers, so please, if you give a shit about Ultra Kill, go subscribe to Herb Messiah. The shit that he can pull off in this game is unreal. I'm also gonna shout out another friend, Scarfulu, for no reason other than I told him that I would if he could beat my record in Cybergrind, and he did, which also means that I'm outing myself as not being that good at the Cybergrind. Hell must be in some disarray if the only thing keeping us from the front gates are a couple of wooden planks. I really thought the God of Carpentry would be running security up in, you know, the other afterlife, not here. Beat down those planks, slide under openings, slap those demons, dash across pits, and Mega Man X up those walls. These are all mechanics that will be used extensively throughout the game, and it's critical that you understand them before you even pick up your first gun. That's just the kind of game that this is going to be. 
Melee is a lot more complicated than a simple bonk to the head, despite it being the first thing you do when you start the game, so I'll explain that in just a moment. Sliding isn't what you would expect from sliding from other first-person shooters. V1 is always propelled forward when he slides, which increases his style points multiplier. You're gonna be using the slide to get out of the way of most obstacles. The dash in Ultra Kill is a lot more akin to a dodge roll in, say, Dark Souls, granting a quick burst of iframes that allows for close proximity to enemies and rewarding your memorization for enemy timing. It also replenishes while you're airborne, so you could get a ton of distance with this thing assuming that you're far enough from the floor. Slapping these other green men around has a little bit more nuance to it to explain. The slogan of blood is fuel is literal in Ultra Kill. That's not the part of the slogan that I never thought about a few years ago, it's more the rest of it that I never really took into consideration. V1 heals by bathing in his victim's fresh blood. So I assume that mankind is dead because he killed them all, or at least the other robots did. Now who built the robots? robots, and why would they, assuming that they were human? We don't know yet. The tutorial tells you that this is your only method of healing. Uh, this is a flat out lie, which does also tie back to the melee system, which I'll tell you about once we get to our first projectile enemies. I don't have a lot to say about the wall jumps, they're exactly what they sound like. Clinging to a wall will slow your descent, allowing you to jump up a single wall or back and forth between multiple walls just like Mega Man X or Mario Sunshine. Ah uh, yes, his name, Mario Sunshine, I fucked that up. Your traction to the wall decreases exponentially the longer you stay on the wall, so you can't exactly hug it like you're wearing the shadow armor, and to balance it, you only get three wall jumps before you have to touch the ground. Finally, to bring this prologue to the prologue to a close, we're introduced to the soul orbs. Usually, there's about five of them per stage, with the exception of boss stages, and sometimes levels have less than five. That mostly applies to the prologue. A majority of them are these blue ones, offering little more than meeting the level's secret quota, and giving you a thousand points to spend at these kiosks, granting you upgrades and variations to your existing weapons. Red soul orbs, while rarer than blue orbs, give you all of the above as well as a full health restore, completely negating any hard damage you might have taken, and giving you a second health bar on top of that. Before we move on to the meat of the game, I want to acknowledge this video's chapters. Assuming that you're watching this on YouTube, you might have seen that time code and think, wow, we're spending a lot of time in the game's prologue. This isn't because the prologue is super long. Rather, I want to spend this time explaining the specifics of Ultra Kill's mechanics and design choices as they come up in the game. This is how I've been doing all of my content since Deus Ex a few years ago, and I'm really happy with this format, but with a game as complex as Ultra Kill, that means we're gonna be here for a while. Uh, I'm gonna enjoy every minute of it, so tell me if you did too. Or tell me if you hated it. I really don't care. Give me engagement. Alright, I think that's about everything that we can cover before we start blasting. Actually, you know what? There's probably so much more that I missed already, but I think we've got the gist of it. I can't think of a better way to begin a game like this. It's such a simple yet enticing opening sequence. Welcome to hell, machine. May your blood harvest with your battery-powered pistol be both plentiful and eco-friendly. The Piercer Revolver, our starting pistol, is probably the simplest weapon in the game. I was about to point out that you don't need to reload this thing, but you don't have to reload any of the weapons in Ultra Kill. Some of them have a cooldown animation between shots that, you know, would essentially be reloading, but I don't view that any different than just holding mouse one and you keep firing. Anyway, instead of holding bullets, the drum in the center is a small generator that works for the secondary fire. Alright, I'm gonna throw some numbers at you with the caveat that you shouldn't assume that these are low numbers. A lot of enemy health and weapon damage is calculated using some very small, though whole, number values. The primary fire from this thing deals, now brace yourself, one damage per body shot, and one and a half damages per limb shot, with two damage per headshot, and other equivalent weak points. The charge shot alt fire is equivalent to three of these hit scan shots being fired at once, either piercing three smaller fodder enemies if one of them is enough to take them out, or striking a single target three times. This will be one of the few stages where we actively use the primary fire on the starting revolver because it is outclassed by so many weapons later on. It's so outclassed that it becomes replaced with a whole other revolver halfway through Act 1. I guess a third of the way through Act 1. If you count the prologue then it's about halfway through. Filth are our first enemies named after the Swans album of the same name. Unarmed lesser husks that hunt in groups. Alright, calling them unarmed is a bit mean in retrospect. I'm sorry to these demons. I guess you're not even demons yet. Can you even hear me? Do you have ears? 
figures, with only half of a health point, you can one-shot him with a body shot or even a quick smack from the feedbacker, and receiving an extra 50% damage bonus while they're airborne. Oh uh, yeah, the melee, at least this melee, is called the feedbacker, which will come in handy shortly. <laughs> handy. Filth are borderline harmless compared to everything else we're gonna meet down here, but still move quickly and hit hard, dealing about 30 damage per hit, effectively punishing the unprepared player. They're not very smart and they can't jump, so they gather around under the player if the player is airborne, which we can exploit very soon. We're told this because they expect us to get the mint style bonus from all these filth. That is the funniest noise I've ever heard come from Hellspawn. Once more, for good measure! Oh, I love it. Alright, we feeling good about these armless fuckers yet? Aren't you itching for some projectiles to bob and weave around? Uh, well, spoiler alert, you're not going to be doing much weaving. Oh right, we haven't learned about parrying yet. I can't explain this, I can't break from continuity. Strays serve as our first ranged hunks of meat. Lesser husks tougher than the filth at one and a half HP, tanking a couple body shots, but can be taken out with a single limb shot. These guys walk around like they have a stick up their asses, which just cracks me up. Though you're not gonna be seeing that very often because they only move to get away from the player and very rarely walk towards the player. Otherwise, they're completely stationary, making them very easy targets when not close by. And for an enemy like this that doesn't have a wake-up sound, they kind of need to make themselves obvious. These guys introduce us to the parrying system. It can take a lot of practice to get the timing just right. They might have made it easier with updates, but I'd rather believe that I just got better at it because I'm a fucking loser. Just throw some hands at these fireballs as they come at you and you'll know that you do it right when you trigger a hit stop. A quarter second freeze frame with an audio cue showing that yeah, you just fucking parried that. Upon parry, these projectiles have increased projectile speed and cause a 5 damage explosion on impact. Fucking awesome. And you can do this with any projectile that has this funny looking transparent skull texture in it. Though you can parry strays directly if you want a more forgiving parry window. This guarantees an insta-kill for some of these lesser husks. And if you really want to ruin their day, you can shoot their projectile from out of their hand for an interruption bonus, causing that same explosion you get from parrying a projectile, dealing splash damage to everyone around them. A successful parry Harry restores V1 to full health, minus any hard damage you might have received. If you want to practice and get a good feel for it, you can use the weapon wheel slowdown feature for a more forgiving time window. I didn't know about this until recently, and I'm so accustomed to the real time speed that I actually found it more difficult to parry while doing this. But it's there if you think that it'll help you. Don't think that you're invincible though just because you're sitting in a geyser of your favorite red plasma or if you're parrying every attack that comes at you. Hard damage is a mechanic that's here to prevent us from becoming too gluttonous with our bloodbaths. Simply put, about 35% of all damage that you sustain temporarily caps your maximum health pool for a few seconds on average. After that, your maximum HP recovers at about 14 health per second. Alright, I've got some more numbers for you and I'm really considering buying a whiteboard for shit like this. Receiving any damage ensures a 1 second cooldown before before your maximum health begins to regenerate. Then on top of that, the numerical value of the damage received is then divided by 20 and then added to that timer. For example, if you take 25 damage from a stray's fireball, that 25 damage is divided by 20 to equal 1.25, and those are converted into seconds. So then that's added to the minimum one second cooldown time, leading to a total of two and a quarter seconds of cooldown before the HP cap begins to recover. However, on violence difficulty, any concurrent hard damage taken before it's recovered adds an additional one second to the cooldown. To my understanding, the cap that's added, that's the damage taken divided by 20, only applies to the first hit until you're completely recovered from the hard damage, so it's not like it's gonna keep stacking. You can always determine the amount of hard damage you've sustained by looking at the gray bar in your health indicator, or by looking at the raw numbers if you're using the classic HUD. But you can influence this cooldown. Reaching a style point bonus of S through triple S will reduce the cooldown by a factor of two, two and a half, and three respectively. That's a numbers a nerd's way of saying that if you want to stay alive, you gotta rack up those style points. Just like delivering a superhero landing with extra steps. A superhero landing that deals a flat 2 damage. 
yes, even the ground slam has some complexity to it that makes it so much more than a straightforward ground slam. First, obviously, it's a very quick way to return to the ground to avoid being juggled and zoned. You can use it to inflict damage on your way down, but you can also hold down the ground slam key to launch enemies into the air at the cost of a stamina bar, which becomes a great setup for enemies with airborne damage multipliers. You can even reach their height by jumping immediately after landing, giving yourself a bit of a bounce. This can be stacked quite a bit. It reminds me a bit of Sonic Adventure 2's bounce attack, but you know, a game that I don't want to raise children in. Uh, okay, that sounds really weird out of context. My favorite part was the Chow Garden is what I'm trying to say. But what if you didn't want to bounce straight up, you might be asking? Simply slide into a jump immediately after landing and all of that momentum, or at least most of it, will be sent 90 degrees in the direction of your choosing. And the potential here is ridiculous. You can cross some crazy distance with this. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. NordVPN is a virtual private network that allows you to connect to more than 5,600 networks in 59 countries with just a single click. By connecting to a server in a different country, you can access content that is usually blocked in your own country, stop annoying internet trolls from launching direct DDoS attacks against your own connection, and improve your online security in general. Malware, malvertising, and even brute force attacks on your passwords are still prevalent issues today, but Nord Security will prevent you from from these kinds of attacks and let you browse the internet as freely and as comfortably as you would like. With NordVPN, you can watch movies, TV shows from wherever in the world. In other words, you can make certain that you won't miss out on your favorite content when you're away from home, maintaining your virtual routine as if you'd never left. Is there a platform that you'd like to use but simply can't because it's not available in your country? Well, simply changing your virtual connection will allow you to bypass any bandwidth restrictions. Because all of your traffic is encrypted by NordVPN, your internet service provider will not be able to slow down your streaming speeds. If any of that sounds appealing to you, then check out the link in the description and get a heck of a discount on a two-year plan as well as four months free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com forward slash thattravguy or promo code thattravguy for four free months off of a two-year plan. Thank you, Nord, for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to it. All right, so how are you feeling after all of that? You think you got all the nuts and bolts of movement and damage? All right, that's great because Maurice will be testing you today. Everyone, please give Maurice a warm welcome. He is very shy and may have resting stoned face, but he is very happy to be here. All right, he's not happy anymore, but that's okay. Let's just take it easy. Malicious faces mark our first lesser demon. Denizens of Hell notably more intelligent than the husks we've seen before. Traditionally, these guys have 15 health, though this one specifically has 25. For now, he's weak to ground slams from above and immune to explosions. And this isn't like the doomed cyber demon where you could still hurt him with a direct hit from an explosive and he's just immune to the splash damage. No, if you try to hit him with an explosive, it'll bounce right off of his face. If you maintain your distance away from them, they'll constantly barrage you with bursts of fireballs. But once you're within range, they'll always follow up two barrages of fireballs with a hitscan attack. The second you hear that audio cue, its target is locked in. They will lead their hitscan attack, so as long as you're constantly moving in the same direction at a constant speed, you will get hit by this. But simply changing your direction as soon as you hear that audio cue, you're gonna be fine, assuming you don't get caught in the splash damage. Uh, I feel like someone's gonna try to tell me that this isn't a hitscan attack and that it's an explosive. These claims can coexist. The aim that it takes while firing this shot is hit scan, it just creates an explosion after the fact. But right at that audio cue, a yellow flash is indicated right before it fires. No, this doesn't mean that you could feed back its hitscan explosion back at it, that's what I thought for the longest time and felt very stupid once I figured it out. This means that you can give him a quick slap in the face with the feedbacker between that audio cue and when he fires to let it literally blow up in his face, dealing notably more damage. It's not exactly enough to one-shot these guys, but it is a significant amount of damage. And if you're wondering 
wondering why he's called Maurice, I actually have no idea. It's just a running joke in the community. I thought that it was similar to another enemy in the game where it's just the name of the model, but no, I, I have no idea where this term came from. Violence difficulty sees Maurice getting enraged after dropping below 50% health, which is something that you really gotta look out for. A single one of their charged explosions is enough to shred half of V1's health. So when you have two of these in the same room, both blasting these same charge shots, you could easily take a couple deaths. Malicious faces were actually one of the hardest obstacles for me when I was actively trying to get better at this game. Just about every enemy, even some of the later bosses that become recurring enemies, I could take out pretty reliably without thinking too hard about it. But whenever a malicious face is on the field, no matter how easy they are to take out, I always need to direct my focus a little bit. And I say this as a good thing. Even in death though, their corpse can launch anything nearby into the air once it lands. The only way to prevent this, to my knowledge, is to deal a finishing blow with a ground slam. You could also do this on the corpses of the malicious faces, because these guys maintain their collision after death. I, I never really see a reason to do this though, it's just a fun little piece of trivia. Oh good, I could finally spend this money that I've been accumulating through uh, blood, I think. It's always good to check this kiosk at the beginning of each mission if you're new to the game. If not to buy the new revolver variants, then to check the tip of the day on the front of the screen. These explain some subtle mechanics that a player might not always think to try. I'm here though to spend some cash on the marksman revolver, one of the cornerstones of Ultra Kill's combat for me. The primary fire for the time being is identical to the piercer revolver, a steady fire rate at one damage per shot. The alt fire though... Okay, well now I could tip my ferryman. Alright, where do I begin with this thing? I guess first off, the trajectory of the coin is always going to be the same relative to A1's position. A1. <laughs> V1. If you're sliding, walking backwards, jumping, falling, strafing, as long as you have constant momentum, that coin will always follow the same arc relative to V1. This also means that if you launch the coin while walking forwards or backwards, that it'll travel more distance or less distance respectively. The closest comparison I could think of for this is the grenades from Half-Life 1. Except not as, you know. Each coin needs four seconds to recharge, but that does stack. Fire two coins and that's eight seconds of downtime that you have to wait. Four coins and that's 16 seconds. Now what's the deal with these coins you might be asking? No, I'm kidding, you know exactly what these are for. Rico shots. I fucking adore these. I've never said Rico shot out loud. I'm just thinking of the penguin from Madagascar. For each ricochet that a shot makes between these coins, a damage multiplier is added on top of the base damage of your shot. Body shots are pretty easy to calculate here. It's an extra one point of damage per ricochet, capping at a total of five damage. That's one damage plus four for the four Rico shots. For headshots, which they tend to target on their own, that's an extra two damage per ricochet, meaning if you have all four coins out, that's a total of 10 damage. As it stands though, only the revolver can be ricocheted, with the exception of our fourth weapon slot which we'll be grabbing uh, later. And it doesn't stop there. Observe, the coin shimmers shortly after launch. That isn't just for show. Strike it with the revolver in this very specific window and your bullet splits in two different directions. And it's not like the damage is halved and sent out in different directions, no both Rico shots contain that full damage multiplier from the coins. This can even stack between coins, leading to multiple split shots from from a single bullet. Walking backwards while launching the coin and then stopping immediately to punch the coin out of the air will keep the coin intact and if there's an enemy nearby, that coin will fly towards him as if it's a hitscan attack, bouncing off of their fresh corpse to fire at and building on some extra damage from bouncing off that corpse. It gets complicated I know, but there's some crazy shit you can do with this. The amount of damage from the ensuing Rico shot is capped at a certain amount, but the amount of damage from the coin itself isn't. So if you can manage to keep bouncing that coin up and down... <laughs> Uh, I'll just show you later. This would be only minutes into the average player's first run, and the skill cap has already shot up a fucking kilometer. Hmm, what do you think he's thinking about in there? Probably about blue balls. I'm not alone. I meant there's a robot, I didn't mean there's a ghost here too. I don't know if he's on my side, but he sure as ain't on their side. Save some blood for the rest of me, man. We could talk this over over some hemoglobin delight.
Wow, look at my handsome son. Were you somebody's skull or were you carved from glowing blue stone? Uh, I want to ask because if it's the latter, then I'm concerned that this is ionizing and giving me radiation sickness. This doesn't affect the gameplay too much. V1 may be holding the skull keys in plain sight, but he could still use the other hand as if it weren't even there. Try not to give it much thought. I like to see it as taking our little blue friend here for a field trip. Probably scares the shit out of him. Just like my dad always used to say, you can't call yourself a true parent unless you take your children to see the crushers. They're beautiful, aren't they? Truly one of the world's- er, hell's greatest wonders. They even spawn a couple of strays right in front of you, triggering them to walk away from you so it appears like they walk right into the crusher. That's fucking hilarious. Oh lord Jesus, give me strength. I can handle this, it's not gonna be a problem. Alright, that was a little too soon. There we go, our first blood orb. These orbs remain in the level for you to collect even if you've already collected them, simply acting as a supercharge to your health, which is gonna be handy for beating this level's challenge. He is not on my side. The swords machine is our first greater machine. To be honest, I'm not even sure if this is the original swords machine. After years of scavenging for new parts, the original swords machine is unrecognizable to the bot that he once was, eventually inspiring copycats, which I assume are the regular enemy variants of this guy that we'll be seeing way later on. And given that we'll be facing another boss swords machine at the following stage, it's kind of hard to say for sure. Maybe we still haven't met the original swords machine yet, and they're saving him for, I don't know, Act 3. Swords Machine is an excellent crash course in parrying. He's a rushdown tank that won't give you any room to breathe, but once you realize that he'll simply run up to you, stop dead in his tracks, and try to pull a move that you could parry, he becomes a bit of a joke. Unlike the more common variants at 30 health points, this boss version has 125. Almost everything this guy does can be parried, or at least spotted with an obvious sound cue, making him a great punching bag for practice. Or at least he is easy practice for parrying once he's not enraged. This guy hates getting parried. He's either taking it very personally or he is writhing in crippling pain. He'll reliably fall to his knees if you manage to parry him, but you can't do that again until he calms down from his enraged state. You can still parry him for that extra damage, but it's a lot more risky now. The easiest way I could manage this without resorting to just verticality and avoiding him altogether is by landing a parry at the first of his 1-2-3 combo, and then dashing through the rest of his moves. This was a bit more difficult than I would like to admit, I think I just got spoiled by fighting him with the rest of my arsenal. Oh, a new shotgun swords machine you shouldn't have. Good thing this guy carries around a shotgun that he himself takes an extra 1.5 damage multiplier from. What kind of guy carries around a weapon that they are specifically weak to? Actually, never mind. That applies to real life too. Also, I was thinking about Metal Man from Mega Man 2. Perfecting O2 is a nightmare if you just stick to the two revolvers, unless you go for Swords Machine. I made this intentionally harder for myself by choosing not to use the shotguns during my redo attempts, even though I already picked up the shotgun from when I fought Swords Machine, which in retrospect I don't think would have gone against my no revisiting past levels rule. Uh, I was really stubborn and I lost a lot of my freshness bonus as a result. To put it simply, the more that you use a single weapon without switching it, the less of a freshness bonus you get. This was significantly more forgiving before the Act 2 update, but now it's a lot stingier to encourage weapon swapping between more than just the last two weapons. Variants still count as separate weapons, so it is possible to stay fresh between just these two revolvers, but it isn't always enough. I had to take full advantage of the movement multiplier gained by staying airborne or sliding, so that most of my kills were during that sliding movement 3x multiplier. That was the only way for me to get enough style points to P-rank this level this early without having to come back later. It was a pain in the ass, I don't recommend you do this but uh, it was very satisfying.
Yeah, this is a pretty decent shotgun. The core eject shotgun, or the blue variant, as I'm gonna be calling it for a lot of this, mows down husks and lesser demons quite well. It's not exactly firing pellets, but firing heat. Every shot fired vents heat from a deliberately overheated core. This is why the weapon doesn't ever need to be reloaded unless the core is actively ejected, hence the name. I'm still gonna call these pellets just because you know what I'm talking about. 12 pellets, 0.25 damage each, leading to a total of three damage if all 12 pellets hit. Great for meteor husks and ripping through the lesser ones. Its alt fire is exactly what it sounds like, ejecting the core like it's a grenade. Three and a half damage on direct contact and 2.3 splash damage for everything nearby. And even has this bit of a push out effect from everything that's caught in the explosion, kind of like explosions from blood. Uh, these same damage numbers can also be achieved with a projectile boost. This was originally a bug caused by the shotgun pellets sharing the same flag that the feedbacker looks for when parrying enemy fireballs. Striking your shotgun pellets with a well-timed feedback accelerates their speed and sends a single projectile straight ahead with zero drop-off, detonating on impact with identical damage values to the core eject. But once you get good at it, it makes it more favorable than a core eject unless you're going for a core snipe. It is very satisfying. I've developed a bit of a habit of switching shotguns during the projectile boost hit stop so that I could quick swap between them and send out an onslaught of explosions. The feedbacker does have a bit of cooldown when used in succession, so you need to space out your shots if you want to spam it like this though. It takes a bit of practice. You can amplify core ejects by sniping them with a pistol, resulting in 7 damage and a red explosion. That is beautiful. Rico shots prioritize core ejects if there's a straight line between it and the coin, making for a reliable core snipe and some insane style points. The blue shotgun can also trigger non-projectile parries for enemies for some added damage when you really want to give Maurice the middle finger. You can't hit projectiles with a shotgun to bounce them back, but you know, for something physical. The pump charge isn't my favorite shotgun, but it's decent. Firing 10.25 damage pellets rather than 13 means a weaker shot overall, but it's redeemed with a faster firing rate. But with a quick tap of the alt fire and a quick Talk my dick. you can load this thing more than I think it's ever supposed to be loaded, achieving two to four tiers of green shotgun goodness. Four, six, and 10 overall damage respectively, with the last doing 50 points of self damage and launching v1 in the opposite direction better and safer ways will be available for launching yourself later on but this is a quick and reliable way to blast yourself in one direction especially if you're already in the air and need to make a snap decision launch if it's just the explosion that you're looking for which is notably more powerful than the core eject you can dash through to negate any self damage as a safe and powerful early game aoe uh, just make sure you get the timing right always dash like half second before you click it's probably something closer to like a quarter second now that I think about it. A favorite play of mine is quickly switching between these two shotgun variants to shred through tougher enemies. Doing so skips the cooldown for the shotguns completely, so you can just spam these things back to back, which turns future sword machines into scrap. I was told that the Act 2 update nerfed this, but it really doesn't feel like it. Like the revolver, I'm gonna be calling these the blue shotgun and green shotgun respectively, and for all future weapons, that's also what I'm gonna be calling them. I'm expecting you to know what I'm talking about when I say blue or green weapon slots, which I realize my might be a little hard to follow since I'm not playing with a HUD, but fuck you, I wanna make it challenging. All right, now it's time to use all this knowledge you've learned on the schisms. I intended to use the shotgun on them, I really did, but the parry gods prevented me from doing so. Schisms mark our first greater husk, the physical consequence of two souls manifesting in the same space, resulting in a tough exterior, lesser motor function and poorer aim, opting to spray and pray rather than throwing a well-calculated projectile. I'm not sure why they look strogified, unless that's not metal parts stuck to them and just flesh. 5 health points, 25 damage projectiles, and a 1.5 damage multiplier from the the later nail gun and while airborne. They are resistant to fire damage, but take additional damage from other weapons while on fire, which is a great excuse to set up some combos. Hello again, Swords Machine. I'm ready for my less humiliating rematch. I'm assuming you're the original because of your dramatic entrance. It would be really embarrassing if that wasn't the case. Uh... 
oh come on, at least the other guy didn't bail after losing his first health bar. Since we already had the shotgun, we could have skipped this fight since we already have the shotgun's alt fire to destroy these cracks in the wall. But if you skip this first phase, you have to fight both sword machine phases at the same time at the end of the level, so I thought I might as well just show this now for consistency's sake. Now where do you think you've gone, you pillar head looking motherfucker? My condolences to your family, don't spend it all in one place. Alright, let's see if we can spice this up a bit. It's not too different, but it's fresh. I like the brown handle. The challenge for O3 requires you to kill only one enemy in the stage. Spoiler alert, that one enemy is the final swords machine fight. The door to the final swords machine encounter is at the very top of this first room that we go in. We just have to break some glass and then get to the top. You don't have enough wall jumps to make it up there, but with a shotgun boost or whatever the fuck this is, we can do whatever the fuck that was. Doing a ground slam and a wall jump with good timing next to each other will tell the game that V1 is ground slamming and rapidly building up that downwards momentum, while in reality, moving at that normal wall jump speed. Top that off with a bounce as soon as you land and all of that stored inertia is released. All right, I watched this like nine hour long dev stream from Hakita and they even do this tech themselves, so I don't think that this is ever gonna be patched out. I could at least see the momentum from it being capped or at least a bit nerfed if it hasn't already. I am very smart. There's not too much to say about getting a P rank here. It's really a lot easier to do when you don't have to fight both swords machine encounters. Yeah, could you imagine trying to meet the criteria for P rank while trying to do that at the same time? Actually, that does sound pretty easy. One second. Oh great, malicious faces are back as normal enemies. Excuse me, sir, but I'd like to return my Maurice. This one is broken. Ah, good, my replacements have arrived. Man, it took me forever to get the hang of the charge back. The first time I ever saw someone pull it off, I thought that the malicious head was just allergic to coins that died on contact. I was very confused. No, you need to make sure that your coin crosses the path of Maurice's hit scan. It's very risky and much like a PayPal chargeback is explosively devastating. All right, I gotta be careful not to break the glass here so I can beat this level's challenge. Good, good. Okay, now let me just... And now that means we can... That would have been unbearable if I couldn't strafe while sliding. Well, I don't know if strafing is the right word. You can slightly influence your direction left and right. Do we get to pet the dog? I always just jump straight to the end of this level, so I completely forgot what was behind here in this back path. And that's what I get for never doing it. Abandon all hope, ye who- oh, fuck. Sir, that is the worst Cerberus fursuit I have ever seen. You look nothing like a dog. You will be henceforth known as Andre. Never mind. Cerberus was not what I expected, and they may not be the three-headed dog guardians of hell, but their name is derived from them. The slumbering guardians of hell who defend against intruders by fucking ballin'. They aren't weak or resistant to anything in our current arsenal, so this is a test of raw skill with what we currently have. He's got 80 health, later nerfed down to 22 as regular enemies, with attacks that deal between 20 to 25 damage. That's powerful enough to kill you in four or five shots, but only really pose a danger if there's more than one of them on the field. 
I spoke way too soon. How come both of the lesser demons we've met so far are both rocks that bleed? Andre balled too hard. You know, with a name like Cerberus, you might have expected to find three of them here, but a boss like that would probably be too much for this opening level without compromising on the boss fight. But this encounter teaches you that if more than one Cerberi is on the field, killing one of them will enrage the other. This is never really an issue for the regular enemy versions, but can be a pain for this boss fight. An enraged enemy Cerberus is really only an issue if you're in those later waves of a cyber grind, and it's usually because something else is taking your attention away from them. I take it back, that is way more than three. The terminal implies that this isn't a mimic situation. Every one of these Cerberus statues that we see is a living Cerberus that simply chooses not to do anything. So, uh, I really feel like I'm being watched. Alright, I meant that figuratively, not literally, but I here we are. So while I enjoy the novelty of the level something wicked, I really despise playing this stage. Here, I'll show you why. I hate him. This is a silly little horror map in which you're being pursued by the level's namesake, Something Wicked. I know that this is a line from the 17th century play Macbeth, but I just can't hear the line without thinking of Woody Harrelson's voice in Venom 2. Yeah, that, that was sure was a movie. Here, I'll slap a map on the screen by Steam user Locked Dream. This will give you a basic idea of what we're doing here, because the only way to navigate this level is with the very dim light from the blue skull that you pick up. Now, I'll give them a bit of credit. I had no idea until now that you could melee with the skull to increase its luminosity very briefly. But this is the only way you could tell what's in your surroundings. You could force something wicked to teleport back to one of his many spawn points if you're able to shoot him, but you are locked to your pistol even if you return to this level with a larger arsenal later in the game, which, you know what, I respect that. That's dedication. Despite my dislike for the stage, I was able to complete it on my second attempt. I hugged the walls and kept my skull ionized, and I was never encountered by this creepy pasta reject. Once you place the red skull on the final pedestal, he despawns for good. I'm not willing to test it to see if he comes back if you pick it back up though. That is all that there is to this level. It's goofy, and you know what? In high school, I probably actually would have been terrified of this. Alright, do you want some lore? Yeah, I know you want some lore. Mankind is a failure. Free will is a flaw. Let the evil of their own lips consume them. Then I shall begin again with my word as law. I have no idea who wrote this, and I doubt that it was the angels unless there is some kind of traitor in their midst. The line being consumed by their own lips makes me immediately think of contemporary politics, stuff like climate disasters and the lack of action taken for them, but it could also refer to the creation of these blood harvesting bots. I'm gonna break the continuity of this video and say that I honestly don't know if it's these bots that wiped out humanity or if they were killed off in this war against hell and the bots triggered that war indirectly, I don't know. We'll see how future X treat this. Oh boy, I can't wait to see our first glimpse of robot hell! Ah, suburban middle school recess. Yeah, that, that sounds a lot like hell. I wish, oh I wish, for some fire and brimstone. And thus, my speedrunning arc is brought to a close. I'll be here all week to answer questions. Yes, you in the back. You're banned for making too many Owen Wilson jokes. Since Lair 1 just began, I'll be covering the secret level now because it's at the very beginning of the first layer of Act 1, so it's not going to be interrupting my script's pacing too much. We're not killing anything here, just doing whatever this is. Where does the line go from the white square? That's right, in the square hole. Just bring the line to the hole and pick up any white dots that you pick up along the way. Don't do this in real life, those are probably bird shits. Play Ultra Kill, they said. It's a revolutionary high octane action game, they said. I'd like to take a moment of silence for the colorblind. Okay, there we go. If I'm being honest, I actually kind of like these puzzles. I'm kind of glad it's over now though. Fuck. Hey, that's how some of you sound trying to solve these puzzles. All right, now where were we again? 
Welcome to Limbo, the first circle of Dante's Inferno. Now, I've never read Dante's Inferno, and I've never played Devil May Cry. I only mention that because this game takes obvious inspiration from it, so I'm assuming that that game- and also, his name's Dante, right? So anyways, this game would, you know, be doing the same thing as that game, but I don't know anything about this aside from what I've researched about it for this video, so I'm flying mostly blind here. Is Limbo supposed to gaslight me into believing that I'm in heaven? Probably. Every room in this part of Limbo has its own fake-looking skybox that you can't see the other rooms beyond, which does a great job at selling this illusion. Uh, there's speakers here too? So many souls down here make it feel like some sort of electricity. <laughs> Funny rock. Yeah, this place is fake as fuck. What kind of technology is this, barf? I'm sorry, I'm a Marvel shill. Oh, the cameras are alive! Drones are our first lesser machines, also tasked with collecting blood. They were initially built with non-lethal ammunition and were later modified by the parts of fallen machines to make their blood collecting a bit more efficient. Yeah, yeah, I get it. We gotta take out the competition. No, mama said I got the most blood. I like to see drones as more of a tool than they are an enemy. Yeah, they shoot at you and they'll dive bomb at you, but you can parry them back into another enemy. And if you happen to meet a certain damage threshold, they'll just explode right there on the spot, dealing enough damage to kill any other drones that happen to be nearby. A Rico shot can instantly put them into a dive bomb state, but it's even easier to just interrupt their attack and set off a chain reaction of explosions. I know I was just talking about tools, but this is kind of literal. The Attractor Nail Gun, a twin barrel barrage of silver nails. 0.2 damage per nail, averaging to roughly 5.1 damage per second. It's got a bit of spread, making it not too accurate, but to accommodate for this, we have a magnet alt fire that can stick to surfaces and lay traps for enemies, or just to stick it directly onto an enemy to focus fire onto. Or, you know, you could just spray from a distance without a magnet and just damage a bunch of strays and filth, who also happen to take an additional 50 50% damage from these silver nails. Same goes for the malicious faces and a few other enemies will be meeting. Ammo for this thing is still technically infinite, and it's not shooting out electricity or sparks, so can you guess how this thing recharges its ammo? I'll give you a hint. Do you remember that scene in X-Men 2 where Magneto pulls all the iron out of that dude's blood? That is exactly how V1 is shitting out all of these nails. Thank you, V1. Very cool. It's probably actually generating inside the nail gun itself, but I want to believe that he's putting them in physically. The influence over the nails stacks the more magnets there are in the field, so three whole magnets on a single enemy will have a stronger effect on their pull, which can even be used to pull enemies that are riddled with nails if there is a magnet down on the field. I've yet to find a practical use for this outside of it just being neat, but it's pretty cool. Oh, this looks important. That doesn't look very burning to me. Maybe it's supposed to be a metaphor, just like the Swans album of the same name. We can't complete this level's challenge until we get the fourth weapon slot of the game, so this is gonna retain a permanent imperfection on my save data until we get that weapon. I'm honestly not sure how I'm going to survive. Gee, all these early husk models burning on the floor makes me feel like we're in Blood's difficulty select. Well done and uh, extra crispy. <laughs> Oh, now I get it. Hey, I think you guys all got the wrong room. The rot auditions are supposed to be a couple steam categories down that way. Street cleaners, another lesser machine. Pressure units that rush the player with an unparryable flamethrower. Though sometimes I really wish it was. So after the world's climate went to crap, I'm assuming more than it is currently right now, these things were used to clean the air in condensed cities. But after mankind did mankind things though, they were repurposed into scouts for hell expeditions. Even after mankind died out, they kept to their programming and kept burning organic material as their way of cleaning. I I'm not exactly sure if they are also competing for blood, I imagine imagine that they are. They could also see that I've absorbed a lot of organic matter that they feel I need to cleanse, but why do they also bleed, you know? I get it, blood is fuel, it probably also fuels these things too, but there's a couple of contradictory motives with these things. Maybe this is why they're the only machines that die from fall damage. 
4.5 health and 50% immunity from explosions, these guys will actively try to dodge your attacks and will deflect explosive projectiles if they make direct contact, literally giving them the backhand. They won't backhand a projectile boost though, so I, I'm assuming that's deliberate. Uh, they're a bit of a motherfucker, or at least they would be if it wasn't for this explosive tank sitting on their backside, which is auto-targeted by the Rico shot. If I'm getting swarmed by them, I like to use the green shotgun's explosion to get them all off of me. It usually does enough to get the job done, even with their explosive immunity. Oh god, the puppy's awake! Oh boy. Sivvy, are you okay in there? <coughs> He'll be okay. That is a powerful rat. I could do better. So Cancer Mouse will ignore all collision in its entirety and will just clip through everything as it sticks to the Y axis. Or is it the Z axis? I always forget. Oh, that was boring. I'm the giant rat who makes all of the rules. Oh God! I know you were a cancerous rodent, but how many eyeballs did you fucking have? Where was Maurice? Who'd have thunk that this level is really short if you don't lure Cancer Mouse into the lava? Halls of Sacred Remains introduces us to split colored doors, only requiring one of the two skull keys to open, but offering us a bonus if we do both. So, uh, treat this like your average TF2 community server and pick your team, red or blue. Oh, what's that? I'm sorry, you just got auto-balanced so your opinion doesn't matter anymore. I always go for the red key first, and I'm pretty sure that this is supposed to be the harder route, but I never really think about that because I always go for both skulls whenever I play this level. Maybe this bitch in tune has to do with why. Regardless of what path you take, you end up being funneled into the blue path, so that auto-balancing joke wasn't just an offhand TF2 reference, even though that's all I intended it to be. Just remember to bring your own soap whenever you go to a convention. Fine, I'll do it legit. I missed an orb, so I have to do it again anyway. After I kill whatever the fuck this thing is. It's always the most obvious one that I never grab. Agony and Tundra. Just as much health a pop as the boss sword machine's first phase, but shares this kind of bullshit link that keeps them both alive until both health bars are depleted within quick succession of each other. You have to take both of them out within a relatively same time window or else they're both gonna get back up. Agony doesn't falter from parries, but will move just as fast as an enraged normal swords machine. Tundra is the same in a completely different way, using sword machine's moves from his second phase. And they both take an extra 50% damage from shotguns, and Tundra specifically takes a bonus 75% damage from explosions, so... That was way closer than it needed to be. Uh, better late than never to pick up the green nail gun variant. Let's use it to cook a scorpion. 
hideous masses, an overstuffed shell of hell mass that's oozing at the seams. And to that I say, hey, relatable. 60 HP regularly and 175 for this boss variant. Uh, you know Scorponok from Transformers? Uh, not the Scorponok that's in name only in the Michael Bay movies, or that weirdly mass-produced Scorponok from the Netflix series? Uh, actually, never mind, this is a bad analogy, I just like Transformers. High Mass has two modes. His upright mode resembling a scorpion that'll fire mortars that you can parry for a free health restore, and a collection of shockwave attacks that are more of a bastard to avoid the further away you are. This is a move that I think is only threatening if you happen to get hit by his tail, which will slow you down, or if you just ignore them during the cyber grind. Occasionally, he'll turn into whatever the fuck this is. Reminds me a lot of Twitter.com when they finally saw Dream's face reveal. He'll hold his tail up for some easy punishment, which is made even easier with the blue nail gun's magnet, which can be combined with the green nail gun's overheat blast. More on that in just a moment. Oh, I gotta replace my eardrums. No matter how hard I try, I can never parry this guy's harpoon. It always feels better to avoid it, because if I try to parry it, I'm just gonna get stuck with it. Hold on, let me try to get good at this. Oh, right. The overheat nail gun is fine, which is better than how overpowered it was before. Its standard fire is weaker than the attractor nail gun, but can hold two charges of these overheat barrages, firing a quick and total 11.4 damage in quick succession, which combined with their 50% damage bonus is enough to completely shred a malicious face in a single fully charged overheat barrage. This used to be better than the blue nail gun in every way, and so now has been balanced by giving the blue nail gun, that one fires silver nails, which have their own properties distinct from the nails fired from this one. I'm doubtful that we're pulling silver out of these guys' blood unless hell dictates that everyone takes collodial silver supplements, but no one else is blue here, so I doubt it. This is also an easy, reliable way to set enemies on fire should you ever feel the need for it, which I rarely use intentionally, but still, it's handy to know. You could also still build up heat for this one while using the blue nail gun, so even though its average rate of fire isn't as good as the blue nail gun's primary fire, you could still primarily use the blue nail gun and then switch over to the other variant, fire a quick brap of bullets, and then swap back to a completely different weapon. If you use it this way, it's a lot more situational, but it still has its use. Alright, let's change our weapon colors to reflect how far we've come in this game. Oh, uh, that is disgusting. I love it. Alright, I'm gonna break my own rules and reference my old Ultra Kill video. Not only did I express my concern that the song that's currently playing is copy written, written as in writing and not rights as in owning the rights to something, but this song is also public domain. That's a grammatical error on top of just a simple knowledge error. That means that if YouTube hits this video, I'm gonna personally mail Hakita a box of my tears. Oh, this looks important. My mind is adrift with eternal torments, lurid vistas painted on the inside of tomes, hollow walls a scream and touch. Mocking song plays for hours even if the sound of birds is all fake. All reminders of my inter enduring damnation. Gabriel, my dearest friend, in presence of penance, I have awaited your embrace to heaven. I have been so faithful, accepting of my fate, but to what end, to what punish am I to take the bare keys, of blah blah blah, my own doom, no salvation. These skulls sneer devilish grins, voices chattering, tempting me with the plunge deeper into hell, and I won't do it. I've hidden them amongst the furnishings, books, and every foundation of this accursed place. Forgive me. I'm not reading the rest of that. Who's the simp that wrote this book? Are you the Gabriel in question? Oh, real shit. Nothing happens, but you feel a strange satisfaction. You decide to name it Hank. Sussy baka. Under the floorboards with Harrison Ford. Was that an enraged V1, or is he just red? Where did he go? Okay, now the primary fire of my revolver is actually pretty good. This is the alternate revolver, almost universally called the slab revolver because you get it by tapping these slabs. At least I'm assuming that's where it got its name from. A 2.5 damage primary fire that actually is firing two 1.25 damage hit scans, but at a slower rate of fire at one and a third seconds per shot. You can set one or both or neither of the revolvers to fit this new alternate revolver. It replaces that weapon, but I actively choose not to use it for the marks 
Axeman because I don't care for the changes made to it. First off, despite the higher damage, it has less of a damage multiplier per coin when hit with the slab. The first coin adds one damage to the hit scan, but every subsequent coin only adds 0.5 damage, and that's enough for me to not want to use it. But on top of that, it also doesn't split the same. Rather than splitting the coin, it adds an additional hit scan to the Rico shot, targeting a single target, at least from my understanding. Which I suppose is good if you're trying to take out one specific target, but that's not always why I use the Rico shot, and if I am, I'm using the railgun for that, not the slab. I guess credit where it's due, the charge shot from the blue slab can result in a whopping 12.25 damage if you can land a charge shot on a path for four coins, uh, but I never really bothered to do this. Alright, so just forget all that knowledge that I just told you, because this boss we're about to fight has a resistance to our revolvers, so that's pretty cool. That's okay, I'm just gonna beat him by parrying. Come on, Hank, we're gonna go kick some robot ass. He's red because he votes Republican. Alright, I'm sorry, that was too far. Is this gonna be the part of the video where I tell you that V2 is a total pushover? I'm playing on violence, look at that damage! Oh shit, I didn't mean to kill him with the coin, I thought he was gonna do the core eject. Oh, God damn it! Fuck your glass. Alright, that's better. Sure as hell not worthy of a P rank, but I still had fun with it. Thank you, Hank. May you be promoted and not gaslit by your in-laws. Alright, I guess these machines are modular enough to just hot swap parts like that so efficiently. So that was V2, a V model specifically built for war. So V1, the robot that we're playing as, boasted a new exterior capable of refueling itself with blood through direct contact. Yet somehow, that wasn't the one built for war. Not like it really matters. The war that brought upon the end of humanity was way before the V models were even deployed into the field, with only a single prototype of each model remaining. And now they're just both sitting down here in hell, slapping each other for who gets the most red juice. That's what Clamato does to a motherfucker. Now let's have a proper dance now, shall we? Not bad. V2 is going to be your first major test of reflexes, employing both visual and audio cues from both hit scan and projectile parables. He'll always attack on a specific tempo, and when it sounds like he breaks from that pattern, it's actually because he just started his core eject. I suppose a well-timed jump when noticing this could give you more airtime to make a Rico shot counter-strike, or just counter it directly with a shot from the revolver, but I was never able to intentionally set this off and it always happened on accident. Yeah, I think V2 is a pushover if you play this fight purely reactively. It's really funny seeing people online talk about how hard this fight is, maybe even me included. I don't remember what I said in my video two years ago. But once you realize that you can just stand still and watch him constantly circle strafe around you, you'll know exactly what he's about to do. Yes, he does change the color of his wings to indicate his proximity from the player, but I barely even pay attention to that because it never really felt like it mattered. I I've been told that if you constantly evade the guy, it will and rage him, but I don't play this fight that way. I have no reason to. Thanks again for the new arm, my brother. Normally it's the evil twin brother who loses an arm and gets a new one grafted on by an ocelot, but this is taking it a, a little too far. This arm is the knuckle blaster, now letting you toggle between it and the feedbacker at really any time you want. Now, the average first time player will probably say, oh yeah, this is pretty cool, but the feedbacker can parry shit, so why the hell would I use it? And then proceed to throw the knuckle blaster into the trash. And I believe this is because it's placed very awkwardly on the keyboard by default. The G key is just a little too uncomfortably out of the way. I've remapped it to my mouse's side button so I could use it more frequently, because this isn't a bad addition to the game at all. It's meant to be used side by side with the feedbacker, not simply chosen over the other. I, I kinda treat it a bit like the grenades in Doom Eternal. I always have myself set to the feedbacker by default, switch to the knuckle blaster whenever I want to use it, and then immediately switch back to the feedbacker so I don't forget. That's probably also a habit that was born from playing without the HUD. Its punch deals 2.5 damage with a one damage shockwave follow up if you hold down the melee button, providing you a quick and easy solution to swarms of filth around you. 
Uh, I also had to find and replace all mentions of the Knuckle Blaster in my script because I swore for the longest time that it was called the Knuckle Buster. I also mentioned in my script that I really miss the shells being ejected from the forearm after you use it, but it turns out that's still there. It's at the very corner of your screen and I never noticed it until now. This should have really been obvious by the get-go because you could see the shells that you eject on the floor nearby, so I don't know what took me so long to notice this. The Knuckle Blaster may not be able to parry specifically, but it can still deflect projectiles with its shockwave. It's not as powerful as the parry, it doesn't speed up the projectile or explode on contact, it's better fit for defensive scenarios rather than switching it up on the offensive, and has the bonus effect of being able to deflect multiple projectiles at one time. I don't think that this is a sole reason to keep the Knuckle Blaster equipped, but it is a nice side effect of it. Oh, yeah, welcome to the Lust Lair, by the way. Oh, that is a very big man. I should not have said that right after saying welcome to Lust. That, <laughs> uh, never mind. Tip of the day! Did you know that when enemies begin to yell in the air, it means they're gonna take fall damage? <laughs> Wait, I need the true experience. Now this is music. Oh my god, they just can't stop! <laughs> Fuck! I always forget about the first orb that's right outside this opening tower sequence, which we're going to use to beat the challenge of this level, which is to never open a door except for the doors that open and close the level. You can skip the entire level by just launching yourself around the map. I did use slam storage to get around this first tower, but I just used a bounce pad for the other one. It it's really not that difficult to get around it. Now let's go get that P rank. Get it? 69 kills in the Lust Lair? I got 10 million IQ points, dad. You ready to meet the soldier? Oh god, that's not what I meant. If fighting is sure to result in victory, then you must Gabriel said that, and I'd say he knows a little more about fighting than you do, pal, because he invented it, and then he Man. Despite their cybernetics, these are still husks, strays fitted with augmentation scavenged from broken down machines that approached hell for a fresh supply of blood, allowing them to channel all that hell energy more efficiently than simply tossing a fireball. Now they fire a bunch of them shits like a shotgun, which yeah, if I get hit by all of them, that is pretty threatening, but I could still parry them. I could parry literal shotgun pellets, so this does nothing. Uh, it's not pellets, actually, it's heat. Shut the fuck up. They're still not too smart and remain mostly stationary, plus with how long it takes for them to charge up one of their fireball mega busters, it's really easy to get the interrupt style bonus with a Rico shot. Their augmentations do shield them from explosive damage, but not the influence of it, so a core eject, or in my preference, a projectile boost, can still knock them into a pit or environmental trap. They still take additional damage from silver nails while being airborne and while lit on fire. So all in all, them firing more projectiles just means more health for me to parry. Oh, that's adorable. I want what they're having. Hello, my love. I've missed you. 
Oh god, I need more pants. The electric rail cannon. Holy shit. A whopping eight damage piercing hit scan capable of penetrating through an infinite number of enemies on the field. Each penetration dealing eight damage per shot. This does come at a cost. 16 seconds of your life, as a matter of fact. But the game makes sure that you know that it's ready to fire even when it isn't equipped. So why get excited about this? Sure, 8 damage isn't anything to scoff at, but that doesn't sound like anything to get too worked up over. Well, I'm glad you pointed that out, straw man. See, the rail cannon is our second hitscan weapon of the game. And while I'm not sure that this is a qualifier on its own, that also means its mechanics can coexist with the marksman's coin. Now, it does have its own attributes, as we saw with the slab. You can't split shot the rail cannon, and it doesn't double damage on each bounce. But it does still add 2 damage to the first bounce, followed by an extra 1 damage per subsequent bounce between coins. But combining the Ricochet's aim at its closest target and the infinite piercing properties of the electric rail cannon, you can do this. How the fuck is this a legal part of game design? The railgun doesn't have an alt fire for the very same reason that this thing is so fucking powerful. You can zoom in with the alt fire button, but Hakita has confirmed that this was added solely to avoid making an actual alt fire for the thing. And hey, we could finally finish 1-2. Ignore the one restart, I was trying to be really cool with my coin punching and ended up biting the dust because of it. And now back to our regularly scheduled lust. I always forget about this group of enemies that only spawn when you go into this house. You won't blindside me this time, fucker. Alright, now to do it again, but fast. Oh wait, I forgot something. All right, let's see. Gabriel struck down Minos, his flesh torn asunder with torrents of crimson blood pouring out from his feet as he cried out for clarity. Justice, Gabriel decreed to all, with our just ruler writhing in wailing agony. The lords will be done. We watched in horror as Minos lay down, now waning, screaming in defiance of God's will, Gabriel. Ah, Gabriel seems to be a real piece of shit. Is this the Minos you're talking about? I'm assuming it is because of the portrait on the side here. I'm also just assuming it's pronounced Minos. What if it turns out to be something like Minos or Minos? <laughs> Dude's named after a fish. That headpiece kind of looks like whatever the fuck is chilling out in the background there. Is Mino supposed to be that big, or did Gabriel just stuff him with a bunch of meat? Well, depending on what version of Greek mythology you're looking at, it could go either way. So if you didn't know, and God knows that I didn't, Minos is a key player in Dante's Inferno. He was already a figure in Greek mythology as the son of Zeus and Europa, and in the story of Dante's Inferno, he was appointed to listen to the sins of the souls that he judged in the second circle of hell, as the souls in Limbo had no souls to be judged. Upon hearing the sims that they committed against the Lord, he'd wrap a serpent around him from his arms, wrapping around them as many times as the circle of hell they'd be sentenced to. The souls he sentenced were then assimilated into the demons of hell, and their bodies becoming lifeless husks. So put a pin in this is what I'm trying to say. This isn't entirely adapted into Ultra Kill's take on Dante's Inferno, but it will become relevant again basically near the end of this video. The other railgun variants are pretty cool, but I rarely use them now that I know how to play the game. I'm not going to say that these are solely crutches that help less experienced players. Some of these do have a practical purpose that affects certain enemies in certain ways. It's more so that the role that these variants fill, I can already achieve with other items and see using the railgun charge as something a bit more valuable. The green variant, the drill, creates a geyser of blood that allows the player to heal themselves much easier. There's definitely ways that pros can use this to their advantage, but there's just more potential with the blue railgun. The red variant fires the malicious face's hitscan explosion, dealing 6.25 damage to everything it hits. And for an AoE of this size, that's not a bad number. I will occasionally use this in the cyber grind if the last few enemies of the wave are these lesser husks, but that's really it. Licorice should not be that color.
Uh oh. I always overestimate how dangerous the Mind Flayers are on their own. It's usually when they're with other enemies that they're actually quite dangerous. Shout out to the Ultra Kill Wikia for having an excerpt from Matthew 528 saying that anyone who feels lust for a woman has already committed adultery in their heart. First off, chill the fuck out, Matthew. Second off, these machines have a curvy figure and booby. Good for them. Never be ashamed to flaunt your body in the right circumstances. I like to make fun of people that get horny over the skin tight latex robot, but the Mind Flayer is introduced in the lust layer, so you all get a pass. Simple way, you fucking nerds. This goes deeper in Hakita's dev stream where they confirmed that they were a stand-in for a succubi enemy, so I, I literally cannot judge you for getting horny over an enemy that is supposed to make you horny, I guess. It could be worse, it could be Mr. Friendly. It does feel a little fucked up that the only femme-presenting robot in this game is one that's covered in skin-tight latex, and the solution isn't to get rid of them, it's to give V1 some latex too. I'm sure we're all in agreement there, right? Give him a fat ass while we're at it. It's actually not latex, it's more plastic. I'm not gonna tell you that this thing is just piloting around a femme presenting sex doll as a body, but I mean, maybe they are. But ever since being turned into a blood harvester, their plastic body doesn't serve any purpose to its mission at all. It's a lot like the concept of gender as a whole. The way you present yourself might not serve any practical purpose in the grand scheme of the universe, but presenting yourself in the body that you feel the most comfortable in can be incredibly empowering. And if these things just want to have a feminine body for the fuck of it, why the hell not? That's not to say that masculine forms of mind flares don't exist. They have been documented according to the lore terminal. This isn't ever reflected in gameplay, and I feel like if they did take this route, they should make it so that a mind flare has a random chance of spawning with a certain body and not affecting their attributes. Once again, calling back to the concept of gender, mind flares are complicated. They'll always teleport around and bounce between firing five homing projectiles that V1 can parry, firing a whole ass Shinku Hadouken that you uh, cannot parry, and very rarely will try to teleport next to you and kick you which you can parry, but it doesn't interrupt the attack, so if you don't dash out of the way, you will still get hit, despite the parry. They'll get enraged once they hit a certain damage threshold and will start teleporting more erratically, but you can inhibit their teleporting by hitting them with the railgun's drill. With good enough timing, you can also deflect all five of their fireballs with an explosion, killing her instantly. If anything, I end up doing this insta-kill completely by accident, especially with a weapon that we'll be getting in Act 2. The challenge of not touching the water sounds really difficult, but it's a lot more about finding an alternate way to approach the level rather than trying to go through the level as it is without touching any of the water because that is basically impossible. It's not too bad, it's just a little restrictive. Honestly, it's this narrow jump between the wall and this little waterfall here that makes me the most nervous, but it's still not as bad as you think. Just smash these three breakers scattered throughout the level, which you'll already have discovered if you've been orb hunting because all three of them are in orb locations, and the water will drain. This is important because the exit is flooded, making it literally impossible to exit the level without touching water barring any clipping exploits. We're not going to be taking that exit though because turning off the water reveals this Slayer's secret level. I, uh, I really don't want to go in there. It's a secret level and it's on the horny layer. I am naked and afraid. Let's go kill the dead king first. POV, you're the Buzz Lightyear figure you lost in your colon. What the hell am I tapping? Oh no, mom heard Mario say bye bye when I put my DS under my pillow. The corpse of King Minos, once the great and beloved king of the Lust Lair, has decayed into a supreme husk. Because of his incredible willpower and status as a once just ruler in life, who was still remembered even a millennia after his death, the manifestation of his soul has become the largest recorded husk to date, at least back at the time of human expeditions into hell. Small traces of the original soul can still be detected in inside of his massive corpse, but the corpse has been reanimated, entirely controlled by these serpent-like parasites that he once commanded. Although he was once responsible for the rebirth of the Lust Lair, his corpse now only seeks to punish sinners. And by that I mean punch. Get that weak shit out of here! I used to really struggle with parrying Minos's fist until I learned that you could dash through it to give yourself some more forgiving parrying windows. Yeah, I really can't believe I struggled with this guy. He's an absolute joke. Sure, the parasites pop out of his eye socket midway through the fight, but that won't stop me from parrying these fireballs back into his rotting face. 
you do need to exercise a bit of caution on violence difficulty. In his second phase, the corpse of Minos will summon these black holes that deal 99 instantaneous hard damage. Refer back to the hard damage section of this video if you need a reminder for how dangerous that can be. It's not particularly dangerous here, I barely even noticed the black holes in the arena, but this isn't the last time we'll be seeing them. Well, you know the saying, the bigger they are, the bigger the door that comes out of their mouth. Now let me in, you got blood in your guts that I could use to prolong my life. This was the only boss that I simultaneously P-ranked and completed the challenge of on my first try. I'll let that be a statement on its own to how easy this fight is. Alright, I guess it's time I take a stab at that secret level. Heavy steps, ragged breathing. There isn't much time left, it might already be too late. The labyrinthian pathways of arbitrary sharp turns seem stranger and stranger as panic blotted out the once deeply ingrained memories that usually guided me. Every corner felt stranger, every line too long. The bell tolls for me. I bit down harder on the last of my rations, only held by the skin of my teeth. It barely hung on as I kept frantically looking around, hoping for the few scraps of burning memory of mine to find a similar sight that would lead me to salvation. The gates must be closing, the last few barely making it. The rest of us never stood a chance. Suddenly, from a blind spot, a figure struck me. There was no time to react before I came crashing down onto the cold, hard ground. I struggled to regain my senses, to at least see what fate would befall me in my final moments. But even in the abyss of endless terror, my mind could have never imagined the horror I witnessed. Oh my god, they put a fucking dating sim in Ultra Kill. I can't do this, dude. Oh, okay, it's actually more of a visual novel because the story always follows the same route no matter what choices you pick. Uh, by the way, this is not V1. It's a completely separate character named Mirage. Uh, the joke here is that she's named Mirage because she doesn't exist. Okay, so this is actually going to be the last time I make a joke here. Oh my god, floor pie! <laughs> That's actually the last time I'm gonna make light of this because of despair. Despite how ridiculous the situation is, this secret, if you could even call it a level, deals with some pretty serious topics, and I'm being serious by this. I'm not gonna make any jokes here because, I don't know, maybe someone in the audience needs to hear what I'm about to talk about. Initially, the level seems to be a very obvious parody of dating sims. I mean, that opening dialogue about holding rations in your teeth is just a parody of that anime trope of the protagonist holding a piece of bread in their mouth. However, if you pay attention to the text on the screen and aren't just spamming the buttons to get a move on, you'll notice how quickly this shit show devolves into a conversation a borderline venting from the developers about existentialism of existence. When Mirage is told that she can't just sit back and wait to be shown the way to school, she begins to reveal the inner workings of her own mind. There is no point in making this situation any worse than it already is, but what's the point of making it better, she says. What's the use of caring? Uh, to put it bluntly, why bother with anything? This comes off as textbook nihilism, the rejection of moral values and the belief that nothing matters, which is certainly not helpful if you're battling anxiety. This suffocating sense that everything in the world is collapsing in on you. The idea that nothing matters in the grand scheme of things, the idea that we're all some sentient stardust following some cycle, is enough to make some people lose the motivation to keep going. Even if it may seem to others that you are just looking for an excuse to be lazy or give up on your responsibilities. I'm not going to generalize with my my audience and say that everyone watching this video has had to face this. There may be many of you who are watching this who have never had to go through something like this. But for a lot of people in my social circles growing up, this was something that I was constantly reminded of. But even in these difficult times, I was able to see the other side of the coin. Much of what the protagonist says here to comfort Mirage sort of mirrors the advice that I was given in therapy as a kid. And it has had a profoundly positive effect on my outlook on life. From my point of view, the lack of a cosmic significance is not a punishment, but rather a form of liberation. We don't have to worry about living up to anyone else's standards or face an eternal punishment for the lack of choices we may make, or making the most of what time we have. In the absence of any higher directive, we are at liberty to determine our own course in life, setting and working towards one's own personal objectives. For some, it might be nothing, and for others, it might be pleasure. For some, it might be the opportunity to create and 
for others, it may be to improve the lives of others. If nothing really matters, then you might as well do what you want to do instead of succumbing to some false sense of higher purpose that you or other people might try to instill on you. It's not a simple problem to solve. This feeling doesn't exactly go away overnight. You'll have to put a lot of time and effort into it before you start to see any improvement, but you can change. You can heal. And it's easy to forget that sometimes when you feel like the world is pushing you down. Helping yourself is impossible if you don't want to be helped, but hearing it from other people's can sometimes make all the difference. Ultimately, it's up to you to finally make that change, but listen to your friends who try to help you to be better. No matter how rough it gets out there, know that someone cares and loves you. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once, this is also a theme of that movie too. It does a great job at explaining this concept of positive nihilism, which I understand is an oxymoron, but I think you get the idea. Yeah, nothing matters, so make the best of it. Be a good person, and try to make your time on this planet and everyone else's the best that it can be. This portion of the video was not intended to be therapy, but if any of you are considering therapy, I say do it, assuming you can afford it. Get screened for anxiety, depression, ADHD, and any similar condition to determine if medication could be beneficial. I used to be adamantly opposed to the idea of being medicated because I never believed it would work for me, but it ended up making a significant improvement in my life. Always try to remember that the people who need therapy the most are often the ones that are the least convinced that they need it. Try to practice self-care, self-love, meditate if you can, or anything that can help you live in the moment. I, I know that this part of the video has become really preachy, but it didn't feel right to talk about this secret level without talking about the subject matter at hand. Yes, there's a funny Sundare robot that's dressed in a schoolgirl outfit, but if that's what it takes for you to reflect on yourself and think about the help that you might need, then I see that as a good thing. Alright, let's get back to funny joking moment. Hold on, I gotta get myself into the attitude. Hawk, balls, amogus, koopas. Okay, I'm good. How deep into this guy's gut are we? This is not what your esophagus should look like. Oh, Minos, it looks like you've got some tonsil stones, buddy. My guy, you have got to stop gobbling down these eyeballs. These cannot be beneficial for your health. Why are they watching me? Call me Jonah, cause I'm diving into the belly of this beast. Oh, there's three of them! Now it's finally a Cerberus put on the fucking dog ears. Oh, Minos, I gotta say, your guts make a beautiful sound. It really brings a tear to my eye. Fuck, I missed one. Ah, I see. The pee door. I'll return for you soon, my beautiful son. For the challenge, I got a boil of mind flare and acid. Well, I, at least I did it. I can't believe I just did that. Oh my god! Oh shit! <coughs> Fuck. <coughs> All of those sounds I just made were real. I did not exaggerate a single one of those. Not too bad. As much as I'd like to say that Belly of the Beast is an underwhelming gauntlet, by the end of Act 1, it actually manages to kick my ass a bit. It's the second to last arena with these three malicious heads, man. I don't know what it is, but whenever I'm in his presence, I just feel overwhelmed with lust. I mean, fear. Uh, though while we are on the subject of lusting over...
Uh, that's not what I meant to imply that I'm lusting over, but I wanted to do this for consistency's sake. No, I meant this. Machine, turn back now. Alright, yeah, sure, I'm not gonna fuck around with voice acting. Machine, turn back now. The layers of this palace are not for your kind. Turn back or you will be crossing the will of God. Ah, yeah, me and the big guy, we go way back. He doesn't mind if I just rummage around this guy's corpse, so don't mind me. Your choice is made. As the righteous hand of the Father. Ha! <laughs> Hands. I shall rend you apart. And you will become inanimate once more. I got cocky. I wanted to kill him with a parry. Gabriel, the judge of hell, who I'm going to assume is Lucy based off of the Archangel from Abrahamic mythology of the same name. Uh, that's Archangel in its literal definition, which I feel the need to point out because X-Men made me think that Archangels were evil angels, and that's not what they were originally written to be, as I found out. Archangels are heralds of good news with a close understanding of God's will. Look, I grew up in a religious family, but I didn't retain a lot of this shit from Sunday school. Gabriel marks our first and currently only Supreme Angel. One of the most respected and feared Archangels, Gabriel has earned his reputation through power and efficiency. Gabriel was always quick and efficient, earning him the title of Judge of Hell after dethroning Minos and ending the Lust Renaissance. What a great fucking name. That is the sound of something that a so-called right hand of God would totally want to shut down. Despite answering to the council, he's more popular and beloved among angels due to his radiant personality and active nature, especially when compared to the Council, which follows strictly faith dogma. Gabriel as an enemy is fairly simple. No resistances, but a 25% damage bonus against nail guns, regardless of which variant you use. Because what else would an Abrahamic figure hate the most? That's right, being nailed to a fucking cross! Oh, that's funny. He'll teleport around the arena, throwing and swinging these hard light weapon constructs at you, and occasionally throwing out a one-liner or two. And that is really the the extent of the fight. I guess if I could describe it simply, he's V2, but he teleports. But all of his attacks are aided by obvious sound cues that tell you exactly what he's gonna do. Just listen for his ground slam attack, dash out of the way and then get ready to parry, or if he's enraged, dash an extra time and then get ready to parry. I always have a little bit of trouble when trying to parry the spinning axe he throws, but dashing through them does certainly help, much like parrying Minos's fist. It's no wonder that Gabriel has become an internet funny man because this guy is a real punching bag. He'll give himself a spinning shield of swords during the second phase of the fight. And this used to be really tricky for me when I wasn't as good at the game. But today, I don't even think it makes a difference with how I approach this fight. It does look very cool though. There we fucking go! How can this be? Bested by this... this... thing? You insignificant f this is not over! May your woes be many and your days few. Are there even days down here in hell or are we doing like a 24 hour honor system? Well, that would have been a P rank if I wasn't trying to be cool. Let's drop him in a pit first. Oh, you fucker. What the fuck was that? Oh, that's two! How can this be? Alright, let's go for one more. 
That may not have been a parry, but I'm gonna count it. Disgrace, humiliation, unseemly and unwelcome at the feet of the council, their eyes ablaze with bitter resentment, glaring through Gabriel's wounds of body and soul, bore outward for all to see. Has this one abandoned the way of our creator? It is unworthy of its holy light. The father's light is indomitable. <laughs> Dom, and this one sees fit to squander it. Their words resonated in Gabriel's limbs, coursing through as lightning upon wire, a searing hiss that would strike lessers deaf and blind. The holy light within him, an unstoppable force of divine fury, insurmountable for mere objects. This he knew. Holy counsel, my devotion to our creator is absolute. I have never strayed from the will of the father, but a machine. You dare imply the might of the father could be shaken by a mere objects? Impossible, heresy. Unspeakable, heresy. Heresy, silence. Your treachery will not be tolerated. As punishment, the father's light shall be severed from your body. You have 24 hours before the last of the embers die out. Oh, hey, I guess this is following a 24 hour Earth Day cycle. So does that mean Dante's Inferno is inside the Earth itself? I thought hell was in some kind of other dimension. And you with them. Prove your loyalty, unmake your mistakes. As the light was ripped from his being, Gabriel's screams were silenced to the hiss of gospel and the praise of God, a boiling anguish to which even the fires of hell could not compare. Through the blaze of torment, a single burning hatred was forged anew. If machines seek blood, he will give it freely, and with such fury, even metal will bleed. And oh boy, will metal begin to bleed. Not from Gabriel, though, it'll be from him. I don't normally do this, but I'm gonna walk along the path just this once because I'm so used to jumping off and landing right where I need to go, but I usually use the whiplash to use the light to guide me better, and I, I can't do that right now. I was a fucking idiot the first time I ever did this. I didn't realize that I could pick up the torch, I just didn't even think to. So I navigated this entire route down by using the light from the nail gun to light my path, only to make it all the way to the end and realize that I softlocked myself because I need the torch to open the gate at the very bottom. I remember looking around online trying to figure out how to open the door at the end of the Prime Sanctum, just to find out that I spent the last 15 minutes on a lost cause. Abandon all hope for my ass is about to be tenderized. I am not mentally prepared for this. The flesh prison, an organic machine meant to encase the soul of King Minos, defending itself with a blend of divine blessings and hell energy. Uh, have you ever played Castlevania Curse of Darkness? Because this fight and the one after is a very blatant on the nose reference to Legion. I know that Legion was also in Symphony of the Night, but in Curse of Darkness, once you kill him, a translucent blue man comes out of it and tries to kill you. So that's a pretty cool reference for all six of you that ever played that game. So what's the deal? Deal here. If you fight this guy like any other ultra kill boss, at least in my experience, you're gonna have a bit of a rough time. When you see a target like this, you might think, okay, I'll just spam the nail gun since he's a big enough target, and that's not a wrong assumption, that will still work. But this guy only takes half damage from nails and the railgun, which will make the average first time player think that this guy just has a ton of fucking health, which actually isn't the case. Try fighting this guy while shotgun swapping and you'll see what I mean, at least once he's vulnerable. The green bar under the flesh prison's health bar is a timer to show you how much time is left until he heals himself, feeding off of the eyeball minions and the occasional Maurice that he'll summon. If any of them are still on the field when that meter goes down, that's a chunk of health that will be restored per surviving minion, and he is not forgiving with this. Now, the amount of minions that he'll spawn, meaning the amount of health he will get back, does depend on the difficulty that you're playing on, so your mileage may vary. I prefer to stick to the marksman and split shot his minions away as fast as possible, taking pot shots while you wait for your coins to regenerate. Because of the Flesh Prison's resistance to the Rail Cannon, it's actually not a bad call to use the Malicious Rail Cannon to deal with some of the fodder if you can get them to group up together. But on top of the bullet hell from all of this thing's minions, it also has three main attacks, telegraphed by the colored shockwave that you see come out of it. If he flashes white, that means he's gonna summon a fucking orbital strike from the heavens similar to an enemy that we're gonna be seeing later in Act 2. Stay out of that fucking summoning circle. If he flashes purple, he's gonna 
to summon one of those black holes from the corpse of King Minos's fight, which here is where I actually find them to be a threat because of the much more enclosed arena. And the cyan flash, well, that's actually the most helpful one to us. I'd use the Knuckle Blaster to send more of these back at him, but I'd rather just get the health restore from the parries. Remember to slide around the arena rather than dashing. Try to save your dashes for when you need to move out of the way of one of those orbital strikes. You'll get through it, I promise. This is actually a great way to take off the ankle weights and to learn a lot of the tricks to Ultra Kill's movement through a lot of punishment. Wait, is it Gabriel or Gabriel? Have I been saying it wrong this whole time? Ah, oh, shit. Now dawns thy reckoning, and thy gore shall glisten before the temples of man. Creature of steel, my gratitude upon thee for my freedom. But the crimes thy kind have committed against humanity are not forgotten. And thy punishment is death. Holy shit, it's Stephen White. I... Oh, holy shit, that was really fast. Okay, Minos Prime, aka the true test to see if you've mastered Ultra Kill's mechanics so far. A Prime Soul is a soul with so much power that it no longer needs a husk to manifest into physical form. As manifestations of pure will, these Prime Souls are so powerful that even proud angels see them as a threat and will do anything in their power to stop them. King Minos believed that the eternal punishment the angels wrought down was unjust and unreasonable to those whose only sin was was to love. And after God's disappearance when the angels were lost and heaven was in disarray, Minos set out to reform the Lust Lair. The Lust Renaissance was prosperous because of King Minos's encouragement to its citizens to unite and form a new civilization. The efforts of the countless damned of the Second Lair helped bring together this civilization. But after this council took control of the heavens and brought stability with an iron fist, they saw that Minos had gone against God's will and freeing the sinners from from their punishment, and it was Gabriel, the brightest of the angels, who was sent to kill Minos. Even when faced with empathy and reasoning, he was struck down without even listening. But Minos's will was strong enough to challenge Heaven's rule. His soul was so powerful that the angels imprisoned it inside of the flesh prison to prevent it from becoming a rampant prime soul. Thus they appointed Gabriel the judge of hell. Minos watched helplessly as his soulless corpse, now controlled by parasites, tore apart everything that that he worked so hard to build, cursing his own weakness for failing to protect his own people and vowing to take revenge. Revenge he really deserves to make on his own, but you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely, so I'd rather just put this guy down. Minos is fast and relentless, but he is reliable. His patterns, while absurdly quick, are almost always the same. Each of his attacks are telegraphed with what line he uses. Die, crush, judgment, all signal a specific move that can be avoided with a well-timed dash or parry. That's not to say that all of his moves will have a specific callout, some of them are strictly visual or non-verbal sound cues, but after a grueling process of memorizing each of his callouts, I found it really easy to dodge what moves he was about to throw at me. But if you're not fast enough to react, and you will not be fast enough to react at least at first, you will be juggled around like the average Smash player that's matched up against Kazuya. I can really only speak for how I personally play this game, but you're not going to stand much of a chance against Minos if you don't learn his parry window, unless you really want to just use the Railgun's drill to get all your health back. But that sacrifice is one of your greatest damage dealers. Better yet, when he does his Judgment Dropkick, you can parry this move quite easily, but you'll still be hit by the explosion afterwards, unless you dash right through it almost immediately. Except he's programmed to respond to this and will follow up with a die if you manage to successfully dodge it. Die. 
much like V2, I think that it's a lot better to approach this fight defensively and reactively. It reminds me a lot of a boss in a fighting game, and I, I love that so much. I would need to seriously consider my options, but I think that Minos Prime might be one of my favorite bosses in an FPS. I can't overstate how much I love this boss fight. It's so fast, it's so hectic, and yet somehow I understand everything about it. I honestly have a harder time with Flesh Prison because of how erratic that boss fight can be. Now, during the second phase of the fight, it does get a little tricky. Unknown to the player, Minos is using a sort of stamina system, where every so on he's generating tokens and exchanges those tokens in for a move that he does. If you're familiar with Doom Eternal's token system, this might sound a little familiar for you. Except on violence difficulty, that token system is thrown completely out the window once you reach his second phase. All of his physical parries are now unparryable. The only opportunity you'll have for a parry are from his serpent projectiles. And for someone like me who uses these parries as his main source of healing, uh, that makes this fight a little hard. Forgive me, my children, but I have failed to bring you salvation from this cold, dark world. Cool. Surely that'll have absolutely no consequences on the state of the world. Oh my god, that is a lot of text. Hold on, let me P-rank this fight first and then I'll read it. Alright, I got it, but that, that, that didn't feel right to me. Let me do that one more time. Hold on, hold on, I can do better. All right, I think I'm satisfied now. So this terminal isn't exactly what I was expecting. This isn't one of the testaments, but actually surprisingly deep lore regarding the elevators that we take at the beginning and end of each mission, documenting the construction of these devices for expeditions into hell before the fall of mankind. While nothing explicit is stated, this is a large piece of the puzzle that we can use to infer heaven's distaste for the machines, and possibly the very instruments that led to their downfall. I was gonna ask how these elevators remain so intact inside the guts of King Minos, but I mean, this dude's spine has been rearranged into the world's most dangerous slip and slide. Maybe Gabriel put some elevators in him just out of spite, just because he fucking hates the guy. And that, my friends, was Act 1 of Ultra Kill. <laughs> Alright, now how long has this video gotten? Oh my god, that was just Act 1? Hey everyone, thank you for making it to this point in the video. Believe it or not, I actually expected this project to end up being longer than it actually was, but I'm pretty happy with it. And I'd like to make a quick shout out to my friend Elliot, because without his help, this video probably would have taken at least three times longer than it did. And uh, my most recent video, Fashion Police, was made during the middle of the production of this video, just so that I could get a video out and appease my sponsors. Honestly, a big silver lining to taking sponsors is actually having deadlines for my content now, so I'm not just completely taking it leisurely. That said though, uh, production on this video was not totally smooth, but that's not for a bad reason. My girlfriend was staying for a week and I thought that I could still get editing done while she was here. That ended up not being the case. So there was basically an entire week where I wasn't working at all and that ended up not being good. <laughs> but I'm, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. There were some things that I wanted to add. I did cut a few corners, I admit. It's mostly stuff that I think a majority of people wouldn't notice. Another part of that is because I've been playing the original fallouts and they're they're actually kind of good i did have to follow a guide to learn simply how to play the game and then another guide just to tell me like how to start 
the game, but once you get the ball rolling, I, I, I did a pretty good job. I'm currently already on Fallout 2, and at this point, I'm thinking I, I, I should make a video on at least one of these games, because a video on Fallout New Vegas or 3 or 4 would be massive, but I don't think it would be as interesting, at least for me to make, as a Fallout 1 or 2 video. Uh, so if you made it this far in the video, first off, thank you, and second off, let me know what you think about that, because I'd love to hear your thoughts. I, of course, want to thank my patrons for uh, helping me stay afloat during this time. I got a list right here. I'm going to give a shout out to everyone who's pledging over $10 a month. $10 or over, I think is a better way to put it. Catgirl Sky, Thickless Mage, Mumbo45, SSG Meat Hook, that's a cool name, Shine Spark, Dante Bishop, that's fitting to the game, Nickel, EMC Mend, Dragon XRD, Silk, Cloud Connection, I Am the Pokemon Master, Otaku de Carnitas, Pixel Pocket, Slim Jims, Media Bin, EMT Neutrino, and Chef Kilo. Man, some of you guys have been pudging for a long fucking time. <laughs> Jesus. If you want to join this list of names off to the side here, you can uh, pledge to my Patreon, you could subscribe to my Twitch, or become a YouTube member by clicking the button right below the video player. I've also decided that I'm going to be moving streaming over to YouTube streaming, so I have a link to that in the description. It's just called Trav Guy Live. It's as basic as it sounds. You could also uh, become a member on that channel, and members there will also show up on these credits. And then, of course, to have your name shouted out, just like all these people, donate $10 or more to Patreon. It's a bit harder to keep track of names that are paying more over on Twitch or on YouTube, so um, I don't include them in the shout out. <laughs> That's kind of dickish now that I think about it. But thank you again for watching. I am incredibly sleep deprived because I was up until 4 a.m. the last three nights working on this project and then still waking up at my regular time at about 10 a.m. So uh, I'm, I'm very tired. So, ladies and gentlemen, and also NB, Shout out to my NBs. You guys are completely valid. Really, anyone who isn't cishet is completely valid and welcome into my community. Cishet people are also welcome, but you have to respect the non-cishet people. That's my only uh, stipulation. Congratulations! If you don't respect people who aren't cishet, uh, you're no longer cishet. That's a terrible way to put it. Anyway, thank you for watching. I appreciate y'all. Uh, have a good night.